Pantero with Walk. Welcome to the Rise Weekly Review for September 26 through October 4, 2022. On Saturday, two people were wounded in the bush heights. Around 4.05 p.m., a 25-year-old woman and 27-year-old man were in front of a home on the 8200 block of South Houston. Someone drove by in a vehicle and began opening fire. Both were struck in the chest. They were both transported to the University of Chicago Medical Center and last reported in critical condition. Anyone with information on this or other Chicago crimes is asked to call 311 or leave an anonymous tip at tpdtip.com. Three teenagers were wounded in a Calumet City shooting Saturday. According to reports, around 10.45 p.m., a group of juveniles were gathered near the first block of 157th. Police arriving on the scene after a shot spotter alert found a 16-year-old boy and a 17-year-old girl with gunshot wounds. They were taken to an undisclosed area hospital. Another 17-year-old boy was also shot and had taken himself to an area hospital. No further details on the condition of the youth was reported, except statements that their injuries were non-life-threatening. Anyone with information is asked to contact Calumet City Police at 708-868-2500 or anonymous at 708-891-7867. On Tuesday, the U.S. Department of Justice released a press release about the sentencing of 29-year-old Gustavo Mata. Mata was sentenced based on his guilty plea to conspiracy to participate in a racketeering activity as a member of the Latin Dragons Nation Street Gang. Mata was sentenced to 420 months or 35 years in prison followed by two years of supervised release. Case documents say Mata was a member of the Latin Dragons since 2009. He was allegedly involved in shootings of rival gang members and participated in trafficking drugs and firearms. Mata admitted responsibility for the 2012 murder of Kelly Van in Chicago, Illinois. 49-year-old Kelly Van was shot in the temple on July 1st of 2012 on 88th in exchange. Mata was arrested with 19 other members of the Latin Dragons who were named as co-defendants of the racketeering and conspiracy charges. Three of the 19 are currently awaiting sentencing. On Wednesday, 31-year-old Clarence Campbell was arrested for a South Shore shooting. Campbell, who is from South Shore, was accused of shooting a man and woman on August 7th on the 200 block of East 72nd Street. According to reports, Campbell was in a dark-colored sedan around 1.50 a.m. when he opened fire on the 31-year-old woman and 26-year-old man. The woman was struck in the face and the man in the lake. Both were taken to the University of Chicago and last listed in fair condition. Campbell was arrested in Crest Hill and charged with attempted first-degree murder, aggravated battery with a firearm, and three counts of aggravated discharge of a firearm from an occupied vehicle. Campbell is due in bond court on Friday. During the week, the Chicago Police Department issued a community alert after a series of robberies in South Chicago and near Avalon Park. According to police, a group of two to three teens has been approaching pedestrians in the areas flashing multiple guns and demanding their property. The suspects either run away or have left the area in silver and black vehicles. On Wednesday, three robberies were committed on 87th. One was committed on Buffalo, one on South Stony Island, and one on South Bennett. On Thursday, two more robberies were committed, one on the 8500 block of Stony Island and the other on the 8600 block of South Commercial. Police are asking anyone with information to contact 312-747-8273 or leave an anonymous tip at tpdtip.com. A police chase in Munster on Wednesday led to the arrest of a man from Riverdale. According to reports, around 6.30 p.m., an officer from the Munster Police Department was on his way to assist Gary Police in another pursuit when he saw a black Kia slam into two other cars on Ridge Road in Indianapolis. The car attempted to flee, but the officer pursued it to the Meyer on Indianapolis Boulevard in Highland. Three people in the vehicle tried to escape on foot before they were caught. Two juveniles in the vehicle were released to their parents. 22-year-old James Alfonso from Riverdale was arrested. He was charged with car theft, resisting law enforcement, and leaving the scene of a crash. On Friday, the U.S. Department of Justice released a new statement under sentencing of Patricia and Felix Amorgabi. The pair, both of whom lived in Lansing, were accused of involvement in a $6.7 million home health care fraud scheme. According to the Department of Justice, the Amorgabis owned and operated three home health care companies, ANZ Home Health Care and Dominion Home Health Care in Lansing and Alliance Home Healthcare in Hammond. From 2009 to 2018, the Maragbis allegedly paid bribes and kickbacks to patient marketers in exchange for referrals of Medicare beneficiaries to the company. 61-year-old Patricia, who is a registered nurse, was sentenced to two years in prison and was ordered to pay 
$1,294 in restitution. 71-year-old Felix was sentenced to 18 months in prison in order to pay $1,592,362. The investigation was led by the FBI and Health and Human Services Office of the Inspector General. On Tuesday, two workers were trapped in a silo in Hegush. Around 8 a.m., the workers were on an exterior elevator connected to the silo located at 2150 East 130th Street. Around 150 feet above ground, the elevator became stuck. The two workers were briefly stuck, but were later rescued by the Chicago Fire Department. An elevator repair company said safety features were working properly and stopped the elevator. They are investigating what triggered the safety features. Neither of the two trapped employees reported any injuries. A sinkhole in East Chicago caused raw sewage to spill into the Grand Calumet River. According to reports, on Wednesday, crews were working to repair a sewer main near 152nd Street and Indianapolis Boulevard when a sinkhole developed. The sinkhole sank a semi-truck and trailer. A 42-inch sewer main near East Chicago's wastewater treatment plant broke as a result. The main moves close to 80% of East Chicago's sewage flow, including industrial waste. The sewage was draining into storm inlets and discharging into the Grand Calumet River. According to the Northwest Indiana Times, there were no signs of harm to aquatic life in the river, which was once among the most polluted in the world. The river, which has since been cleaned up, was thought to have been contaminated with concentrations of ammonia nitrogen of as much as 4 to 5 parts per million. It was expected to dissipate to 1 to 2 parts per million within 15 feet of the discharge. East Chicago had cleared up the sewage by the end of the day Wednesday, but is expecting the sewer main repair could take as long as a few weeks. More information came out during the week about the response by city officials for the Lightfoot administration over a complaint filed with HUD by environmental groups alleging environmental racism. In the letter, the city requested that HUD revise its findings that the city violated Title VI and Section 109 protections. Title VI of the Civil Rights Act prohibits discrimination based on race, color, and national origin. Failure for the city to comply can result in the loss of millions of federal funding and referral to the Department of Justice. In the letter, the city claims that the results of the HUD investigation were based on inaccuracies. HUD is overstepping its jurisdiction, and the city's ultimate denial of the permit prevented any of the alleged environmental harm cited by HUD. The city uses these arguments in an attempt to demonstrate HUD has no legal basis for their claims of racial discrimination. The city claimed that there was no proposal for General Iron to move to the southeast side. According to the city, General Iron had closed down. RMG had purchased some assets from the closing business and sought to use them to expand its own operations, which have existed in the area for over 20 years. The city claims it had no role in any of these decisions. It also claims the decisions, including zoning, were based on business opportunities and there was no evidence that race was a factor in decisions. It also claims that neither the Chicago Department of Health or Zoning Board approval were different from other decisions made and all followed the process which eventually resulted in the permit denial. This attempts to counter claims that there was a willing negligence by the city in considering health or other concerns as part of a racist effort. In its arguments against HUD's jurisdiction, the city claims HUD has decision-making on residential, not industrial facilities, and that these decisions should be made by the EPA. The city cited examples where the EPA supported the city's efforts and seemed to suggest that HUD was contradicting the EPA which it claims has jurisdiction over the location of industrial facilities. A big part of the city's argument is that HUD is misapplying Title VI because the permit denial has limited any claims of injury. The city uses similar arguments to claim it has an active commitment to environmental justice. The city ends the letter by requesting HUD revise their decision and suggest it will proceed with the court appeal to the complaint if HUD continues its efforts. On Saturday, ABC News reported about the Better Government Association's attempts to get the city of Chicago to crack down harder on Southeast Side drag races. According to the report, the city has been issuing $150 tickets for racers and spectators. However, the data provided by the Better Government Association shows that many tickets are being given for bike lane violations and not specifically racing. The Better Government Association analysis found that more than 520 tickets up to a total of $78,000 of fines have been given near Big Marsh since the beginning of 2020. Park advocates have been urging the city to push speed cameras and bumps to push car racers out of the area. 
Car races have a history in the area. Local area residents have raced cars near the area for decades, even though car racing is considered illegal. The races on the area were taking place decades before Big Marsh was developed into a park. The bike lanes also take over the parts of the road that would typically be used for car parking on other major roads. During the week, the Chicago Defender reported on challengers in Chicago's black majority wards that include several on the Southeast side. According to the report, following departures of four black aldermen, several new candidates have emerged to challenge longtime incumbents. While the openings have occurred in the 4th, 5th, 6th, and 21st ward, the Crusader also mentioned several Southeast side candidates. The Crusader article mentioned Jocelyn Floyd, who will be challenging 7th Ward Alderman Gregory Mitchell for control of South Shore, parts of South Chicago, and South Deering. As we mentioned in our last review, Floyd is also a mediator in a conflict between the city, Greg Mitchell's office, and four black women entrepreneurs who accuse Mitchell of using aldermanic privilege to stop them from opening businesses in the ward. In the 8th Ward, which includes East Chatham, Avalon Park, Burnside, parts of South Shore, and Cottage Grove, Incumbent Michelle Harris is being challenged by Linda Hudson and Sean Flynn. Hudson is a tax professional with years of experience as an area activist. Sean Flynn once served as Alderman David Moore's Chief of Staff. In the Ninth Ward, that represents Roseland and Pullman but recently lost Algel Gardens, longtime incumbent Anthony Beal is facing a rematch with Cleopatra Draper. Candidates have until a November deadline to submit their petition signatures to be on the February ballot. And that ends our weekly review for September 26 to October 4, 2022. Thank you for joining us for this week in review. Peace.